Welcome to another strength lecture series. I'm Dr. Trevor Cottrell and today we're going to talk about muscle cramps. So many people here who are listening to this are athletes or have worked with athletes and at some point you have personally experienced or been next to someone who has experienced a muscle cramp. Specifically we're going to talk about exercise associated muscle cramps, E-A-M-C, which can be a little different than other cramps because there's lots of different cramps you can get at different points in time. But specifically, we're talking about those cramps that you get when performing vigorous physical activity. This is a pretty interesting topic because there's a lot of mythology that surrounds muscle cramping, and what causes it, what the treatments are for it. So the purpose of this lecture is to give you a little bit of background on what we know, or most of what we don't know about cramping. Talk about some of the mythology that surrounds cramping, and actually look at some potential ways to deal with an individual who may be cramping regularly. So ultimately, what is a cramp? A cramp, a muscle cramp is a sudden and involuntary contraction of one or more of your muscle groups. If you've ever experienced a cramp, you, you know that feeling. You can feel kind of a tightness forming. You think, okay, it's tight. But then the next contraction, it gets ex exponentially more tighter. And if you try contracting it, it gets even worse. And it gets to a point where you cannot even relax that muscle. This intense muscle contraction causes a significant amount of pain and uh, loss of function obviously because the muscle when it's locked up you cannot actually use that limb and move that joint. So pretty painful, pretty debilitating. If Even if you're working at elite sport level you'll still see athletes cramping. Uh, cramping the hamstring, very common in sprinters, usually a precursor to hamstring tears quite often. So if you can solve this cramping problem then obviously you could be a very very rich person because many people would pay for the ability not to cramp during their events. Cramping is a huge debilitating issue, especially in endurance events, and I'm going to use some examples of endurance events, even though a lot of people listening to this may be more of the strength and power related background. So I always like to start this talk by doing a little pop quiz. So looking at this multiple choice question, what causes muscle cramps? You have a choice of A, dehydration, B, loss of electrolytes, C, low glucose levels in the blood, D, fatigue, or E, all of the above. So a lot of you are probably going with all of the above. Some of you may be leaning more towards dehydration electrolytes. If you think if I was to quiz the average person on the streets of this, a lot of them would go to that electrolytes route because anybody you ask, okay, if you're cramping, what should you do? Eat bananas. That's the answer all the time. Eat a lot of bananas. Why? Well, they have high potassium. Well, why is that good? Well, I don't know, because it's an electrolyte. Well, there's lots of electrolytes and lots of foods. Why not eat a bag of chips? They're high in sodium. That's an electrolyte. Um, why not... Um, Go to McDonald's, have a Big Mac. Lots of sodium electrolytes in that as well. Why not eat a tomato? Tomato is high in potassium as well. So there's a lot of this mythology that comes out here, you know, that eating bananas, drinking more fluid is probably the most common story you'll hear as soon as you hear about someone cramping. Even doctors, physicians, not that physicians have been really trained in these kinds of things. Uh, I had an athlete who suffered from fairly regular cramping, went to a physician, their response is eat more bananas, drink more water. And that's, that's, that's what four years of medical training, I guess, gets you. Hopefully they'd have a little bit more insight than that. But there's lots of remedies out there. The problem is, is that because cramping is such an issue in so many athletes, lots of different uh, characters have gotten into the game. Maybe you've heard of pickle juice. Pickle juice, you can actually buy it bottled now. You know, or you could just go and buy some pickles and pour the juice off, but they actually bottle up this stuff and sell it for a profit, all natural pickle juice. And so pickle juice obviously high in sodium, a little bit of a bitter tart flavor. Uh, I've sat through talks by athletic trainers swearing by pickle juice and one athletic trainer stated, ah, every football player on our team before they walk out on the field for a game takes a shot of pickle juice and that prevents cramping. And uh, okay, all right, I'll take your word for that. How did you actually quantify that? How did you assess whether it was pickle juice or something else? Why did you just do it at games and not practices? Did they cramp a lot in practices when they didn't have pickle juice and then they didn't cramp during games when they did? So just what happens is people get in the habit of, uh, of doing certain, these certain things and it gets passed down generation to generation and pretty soon nobody's really sure why they do it. They just know that 
it's supposed to prevent cramps. The research on it is pretty sketchy. Other uh, common supplements, salt supplements, salt tablets, of course. It's those electrolytes. If you're cramping, you're, you're deplete electrolytes. Marathoners, triathletes, oh my goodness, they get so hung up on their electrolytes. There's no doubt that electrolytes are important. There's no doubt you're sweating a lot and you're losing electrolytes. But these people are sucking back grams and grams of electrolytes every hour. And... Um, and products like this where you can just actually literally they're granules of salt that you can put on your thumb and lick right off and um, that supposedly will take care of the cramping I know uh, people who have used this one person in particular said yeah I was cramping on the bike uh, I took a lick of this one minute later my cramp went away well yeah it's pretty obvious that the sodium didn't get into the bloodstream then get into the muscle in that one minute period of time there's probably something else going on did the cramps stay away? No, they came back. Okay, did you lick again? Yes, it did. And it felt like it got a little bit better, but they got progressively worse. Okay, so was it the salts or was it something else going on there? One well, of the newer inventions to the market is the hot shot. So capsaicin type supplements that are very spicy and hot. Uh, research, uh, very minimal thus far. Marketing, very maximal so such thus far. Boy, they have a good marketing push, and it kind of makes sense and may help with a little bit of a placebo effect. There may be something to it. You notice, so pickle juice being very tart, uh, base salts being very salty, hot shots being very hot. If you know much about your tongue, your tongue has kind of four major areas of sensation. So we have bitter, hot, um, uh, sweet and salty. So all these things kind of trigger major neural areas on the tongue. So there could be something going on there, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Nonetheless, there's lots of products out there that swear by their abilities to prevent cramps. Alternately, though, people still cramping. It's kind of like those weight loss uh, miracles that you see on TV. If it was only that easy, there'd be no obese people anywhere, right? So if this stuff all worked, then there'd be nobody cramping anywhere. So let's come back to some of the mechanisms of cramping. People talk about electrolytes, they talk about loss of energy, they talk about fatigue. I'm just going to show a little bit of data that I collected from an Ironman triathlon. And this has been corroborated by other research, but I thought this is a nice and clean way to look at it. Here's a subject that experienced cramping during a full Ironman triathlon, so 140 miles, about a 15-hour race for this individual. Uh, we measured their blood and urine before at the end of the event and then during each transition. So what we have here on the x-axis at the bottom, this is be about an hour before the event swim. This is after the swim is transition one, so before the bike. Transition two is between the bike and the run and finish obviously is within an hour after finishing the event. On the y-axis, this is the concentration of the products in millimolar. And here we have blue represents sodium, red represents chloride, green represents glucose. And you can see throughout the race, sodium and chloride were pretty stable. Little tiny decrease at the end. Um, I had multiple subjects, obviously, in this pilot study. If you look at the average, it was pretty stable. Maybe a slight trend towards a decrease at the end, which isn't terribly surprising. But what that means is that this individual is fairly successful at maintaining a decent nutrition and hydration strategy during their exercise throughout the event and ultimately did not experience a significant loss in electrolytes. Nonetheless, they experienced significant cramping. Glucose as well. People say, well, they're just not eating enough. I need more glucose. You'll see glucose levels here pretty normal at the start, maybe a little bit lower than um, uh, normal at the first thing in the morning and it drops down after the swim because they can't feed during the swim. During the bike, they're able to eat a lot. So they get a lot of glucose in their system during the run. It's harder to eat, so they go down. But if you look at this is pretty normal. That 60 to 100 millimolar range is pretty normal fed glucose level. So there's no indication that any of the cramping they experience may have been be because of this nutrition profile. Also, their body weight, they changed by almost 2%. That's pretty normal. Uh, so it imp implied that there was some mild dehydration that occurred. But within norms, you know, you'll experience 2% dehydration in an hour of exercise in, in the gym with a little bit of a sweat. That's not too abnormal. But what was interesting in this uh, same athlete, here we have the same event um, uh, blood collection times. So pre-event, transition one, transition two, and finish. 
On the y-axis, now we have creatine kinase, and this is total creatine kinase, which is an indicator of muscle damage. So you work a muscle too hard, eventually it actually cannot keep itself energized. When it can't do that, then proteins start to stop doing the jobs they're supposed to do. Combine that with mechanical trauma of contraction, the actual muscle membrane breaks down. There's a membrane that coats, that surrounds a muscle cell. And uh, that breaks down. When that breaks down, proteins spill out into the blood. One of the proteins is creatine kinase. So we measure this uh, enzyme in the blood as an indicator of muscle damage. And you can see before the race, normal levels, you want to keep it below 200, 250 is kind of what we talk about. By the end of the swim, it's starting to creep up, implying some physical work's taking place. End of the bike, it's crept up a little bit more. So now it's above normal levels. By the end of the run, it's quite extreme. So indicating that quite a bit of muscle damage has occurred. And you see this consistently in any endurance athlete throughout the race. I've had individuals up in the tens of thousands of units per liter. So pretty extensive muscle damage. So there, at least here, there's a correlation between muscle damage and the cramping that occurred. So it's probably a little bit better target to look at than those electrolytes and glucose. And again, if you look at the literature on this, there's a lot of literature that uh, indicates that um, muscle damage may be a better predictor and muscle fatigue a better predictor of cramping than, say, nutrient profile. So if I had to summarize uh, what I just discussed, it's that there's a bit of dogma that we have to eliminate. First of all, you can get cramping independent of changes in electrolytes. So as soon as someone cramps, it, you can't always just say, well, eat more salts or eat more potassium. The likelihood of it being an electrolyte disturbance is not likely unless it's been a very extreme, very hot, very prolonged event where they have not been feeding or hydrating properly. Similarly, speaking of hydration, cramping can occur in well-hydrated individuals. So often, someone's cramping, well, it's because you haven't been drinking enough. Drink more water, drink more water. Well, people die of over-drinking water. They drink so much water, and it's not uncommon in football players, triathletes, marathoners, to drink just too much water to help manage the cramping, and they end up going into a situation called hyponatremia, which actually can cause death. Some people say, well, the reason you're cramping is you're not very fit. And again, there could be some relationships there we'll get into in the next couple of slides, but they're finding that some very fit individuals are cramped just as likely as unfit individuals. And then cramping can occur in the absence of muscle damage. You don't have to have a very worn out, damaged muscle in order to get cramping. So these are the common things people blame on cramping, but you can see the research has shown that you can get cramping despite these things. However, any one of these conditions may influence cramping in people who are already susceptible to cramping or are um, uh, in events that are likely to induce cramping, like, it, like the triathlon type uh, situations. So it's not that they can't influence cramping, it's just to point to them as the cause of cramping is a big assumption and it can be erroneous and it could lead to the wrong interventions which can cause problem. If you're consuming too much salts, your hands are going to swell up, your feet are going to swell up, your kidneys may have problems and uh, start shutting down, and you can actually um, toxify the blood and get hypernatremia or hyperkalemia or situations like that. If you're drinking too much water, I mentioned you can get run into problems with that. So ultimately, what is causing this? Well, here's a little bit of a hand-waving statement. There's a couple of reviews done. This Miller review in 2015 is it's more of a commentary. It's a little summary that says, hey, let's get our act together and figure out what this stuff is. But basically, the quote is, the cause of cramping is multifactorial, unique to each athlete, and caused by alterations in the nervous system. Ultimately, the cramping event is not a nutritional phenomenon. It's a neurological phenomena or neuromuscular phenomena. What we do know is when cramping occurs, there appears to be this hyperactivity of the motor neurons, so the nerve that supplies the muscle, and it could be related to an overactivity of what we're calling a, a stretch reflex or H reflex. Or So, for example, the muscle responds to quick stretch by contracting. That's a reflex arc. Uh, the muscle senses the stretch. It sends a, me sends a message to the spinal cord, which then tells that muscle to contract in response. It keeps you from tripping and falling all the time. But for uh, they found that in, in cramping situations, that reflex is on too much. It's like on this... Uh, um, self-positive, we call it positive feedback loop, where the more you get, the more it turns on, the more it turns on, the more you get kind of thing. 
And so that muscle just goes into this reflex spasmodic state that's really hard to relax. But the thing is, we aren't really sure exactly what triggers that. We know that uh, very intense muscle fatigue and very prolonged events are pretty good at inducing this. They try and induce this in research by using intense muscular stimulation, using uh, electrical stimulators. Uh, animal models, they do similar types of things with to try and get it. But ultimately, it's really hard to study this stuff in humans because you can only dig at the muscle so much and the exact way to induce cramps in you may be different than the way you induce cramps in me. So ultimately, it's very difficult for us to make conclusions as to how, the best way to prevent cramping. So what do you do? It sounds like I'm not giving you a lot of help here. Well, the uh, first thing, let's just get rid of the mythology and, and stick with what facts we have. And then there's some strategies to work through. So one of the best predictors of whether or not you're going to cramp in the future is whether you cramped in the past. Anybody who is cramped regularly, for some reason, they're more susceptible to cramps. Why that is, it's not clear. Again, this neural phenomena. But part of it is, if you've ever worked with people who are cramping, uh, it's a phenomenon whereby, oh, I cramp all the time. So they go into workout, oh, I hope I don't cramp. I hope I don't cramp. Oh, wait, my muscle's feeling tight. I think it's going to cramp. Oh, no. here. So basically, they're, they're self-inducing a little bit of a cramping phenomenon just through overthinking of it that can trigger overattention to it, which may trigger this hyper-reflexivity of the, of the muscle spindles. That could be what's going on. I'm just making stuff up here, but that could be what's going on. All we know is that those individuals seem to be more likely to get a cramp. So the best way to prevent cramping in the future is try not to cramp at all. So if you start feeling, so we're kind of um, skipping ahead to four, if you start feeling a cramp coming on, if you feel tightness in the muscle, it's important that you go through a variety of strategies to relax that. Uh, stretching, for example, is classic. Uh, massage is another one, whether it's foam roller or ball or peanut or hand or vibration device, whatever it may be, that could be another one. But sometimes it's just a matter of you calming down. Like just feel that muscle relax. Just let it relax. Just calm, deep breaths, all right, and keep that muscle in a lengthened state. It doesn't have to be a full stretch. But sometimes that's enough during that early onset when you're feeling that tight that um, that can abate that cramp. And so you're trying to avoid those cramping. As soon as you feel it, see an athlete that they're, you'll tell when an athlete's working hard, they'll start rubbing a muscle. They'll start kind of flick kicking their leg back and forth or, or doing a little extra stretching when you know they usually don't do that extra stretching. That's a pretty decent sign that maybe they're experiencing that early stage of a cramp and you've got to shut them down. No sense working through it. You try keeping working through that cramp, it's just going to get worse. And then you've got a situation where this person experienced cramp, they're, they're a little bit paranoid of cramping again, and uh, they're more susceptible to cramping in the future. Of course, you want to maintain good hydration feeding. There's no doubt <laughs> you let a person get extremely dehydrated and unfed and you're exercising, they're going to be in a situation where they get more muscle damage, less muscle performance, and by the way, they may also cramp. So that's pretty straightforward stuff. Avoid snake oil remedies. So, so, so many people rush to these snake oil remedies, whether it's the pickle juice or hot shots or whatever it may be. And uh, you don't want that to be the solution to your cramping. Usually you want to look back at number one as being more the solution. Preparation is better than um, reaction in my books. That being said, there is enough anecdote of people who have used some of these snake oils that they've experienced some relief that it could help. There's a situation, it's like um, if you have a pain in your foot, hit your hand with a hammer and you won't feel the pain in your foot anymore. There seems to be some some kind of... Uh, it's almost like what we call the neuromuscular gate theory. So if you can close the gate to that reflex response, then maybe it'll stop. So it's, it's thought that maybe there's something to do with that hot, bitter, salty, or sweet, maybe even flavors that the tongue detects. Something about that sensation on the tongue will distract the nervous system and maybe help and some of that positive feedback loop that's causing that greater and greater contraction that's going on in the muscle. So there could be something there. We just don't know. And there's so much individual difference and there's so many different products to just say, this is what you do to cure a cramp. That's not going to work. So what you got to do is maybe work with the athlete a bit and try a few things and see what happens. And uh, maybe you'll find one thing that might work for that athlete. 
Ultimately, stretching, massage, and relaxation, as I said, at the earliest onset of a cramp. And overall, just training in situations that may induce cramping in the game. So if you never do many sprints, and you're a football athlete, and all of a sudden you go into a game and you're out there for 30 downs and you're sprinting every down, what do you think is going to happen? Obviously, you're going to get intense fatigue, which will induce cramping. But if you've trained an individual, if you've prepared, if you've done those sprints over and over again, and you know you don't cramp, you just don't. You've done. There's nothing I can do out on the field that I haven't done worse in practice. Then the likelihood of your cramping has gone way down. Still could happen, but it's it's really mitigated. I've worked with athletes who are very chronically uh, likely to cramp. Uh, they they just say I cramp at everything, and just through training, nice gradual training over time, six months later, things that used to induce cramping, they just they don't even think about it anymore. It's just it's not an issue anymore. And uh, that's because they've become conditioned to using the muscle in a certain way and not just allowing it to go into cramp. They've kind of detrained themselves out of that cramping phenomenon. And then, you know, keep an eye on the individual, right? So every individual, some athletes, they sweat a ton. Those athletes may need more electrolytes and they may need more water. And there's a variety of tests out there you can do to measure sweat rates. And then there's ways you can analyze sweat, which the validity people question. But, uh, you know, if, you've, if you're dealing with a high-level athlete, you may want to take the time to go out there and figure out, you know, really what do I need to optimize the nutrition in this athlete. Don't just say, well, bananas and water don't work at all because food is food, nutrition is nutrition, hydration is hydration. There may be a need for that athlete to maybe consume a little bit more of one thing or another. Anyway, so I hope that's helpful. That's my uh, strength lecture series for today. I'll see you guys at the gym.